Y'all, this is Todd Foolery, and it's fascinating to see how television evolves over the years and how some shows wouldn't have come to be without its predecessors. Take out Zoe 101 came before iCarly, or Unfabulous came before Zoe 101, Taina before that, then The Amanda Show, then The Mystery of Shelby Wu. Come to think of it, none of them would even exist without the OG Clarissa Explains It All. In 1991, under Geraldine Laybourne's leadership, Nickelodeon took a chance producing a female-led teen sitcom amongst their active lineup of ensemble shows, cartoons, and then game shows. And I say took a chance because they feared the show wouldn't garner a male audience. Well, they were wrong. <laughs> Not only was the show a hit with girls and boys, it generated some of the highest ratings for a cable production. It also successfully ran for five seasons, airing its series finale on October 1st, 1994. But we're not here to discuss that. And as great as all those other shows are, none of their leads could turn into a puddle of water. So in this video, we're revisiting a world before Teen Wolves, one prior to super-powered high schoolers, and even a world ahead of teenaged witches. And that is the secret world of Alex Mack. Before we get started, thank you so much for watching. I release new videos weekly and I'm trying to get to 10,000 subscribers, so I need your help. Don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell to support me and then more videos like this. Last thing, I was gonna make this one really long video about the entire series, but after watching the first season, I had way more to say than I thought I was. Then with 20 plus episodes per season, a four part series to match the four seasons is probably much better for my sanity. So for those of you who need a reminder, The Secret World of Alex Mack is about 12 year old Alex Mack. She was just another average kid until her first day of junior high. One minute she's walking home, the next there's a crash and she's drenched in some sort of weird chemical. And since then, nothing's been the same. The top secret chemical GC-160 gives Alex the ability to move things with her mind, shoot rays of electricity from her fingers, then turn into a puddle of water. Yes, a puddle of water. She also glows when she's embarrassed for some pointless reason, and I see how that could be awkward, but most times it's just brushed off as a weird tan. Anyway, her best friend Ray thinks it's cool, and her sister Annie thinks she's a science project. And they're the only ones that know, as she keeps it from her parents, Barbara and George Mack, out of fear of what they might say, but also because show needs to happen. Aside from her powers, junior high, and then being a teen, Alex must watch out for the evil CEO of the chemical plant, Danielle Atron, her henchman Vince, and then their bumbling truck driver Dave. Anyway, it's all explained in the opening title. Just go Google it, I'll wait. <laughs> Lastly, we'll loop around back to the cast in part four of this series, but yes, Jessica Alba is in it. It's literally only like four episodes, she plays a bully, and that's that on that. Now, I can't talk about the show without briefly mentioning its creator, Thomas W. Lynch. And that's because he produced a lot of what we forgot we watched growing up. Good old Tommy produced Kids Incorporated, which featured early roles for Fergie, Jennifer Love Hewitt, and Mario Lopez, The Secret World of Alex Mack, The Journey of Alan Strange, 100 deeds for Eddie McDowd, Scout Safari, The Jersey, Class of 3000, and just like so much more. He's even been credited for producing a show as recent as 2016 called Make It Pop. This guy's responsible for some iconic television and his career seems to really take off right after Alex Mack and quite frankly, after re-watching it, I see why. <laughs> While I enjoyed this show as a kid, holy shiza! was I surprised at how much I enjoyed it as an adult. And that's not just the nostalgia talking. In fact, I attribute my enjoyment to three things. The comedy, the characters, and the storytelling. Comedy is serious business. I mean, great comedy expresses pain and anger. Mmm, can't wait to hear those jokes. Now, when I used to think Alex Mack, I remember drama. Like, boy stuff, her sister being annoying, school bullies, powers. I don't remember any comedy at all. And thinking about it, it's probably because my thoughts immediately went to the series finale and that was a wildly dramatic episode. But in reality, this show is a sitcom. It's about Alex and her powers getting into a bunch of situations, sit, which result in some sort of comedy. Calm. Sitcom. And I legit found myself laughing out loud at times. Of course, there's still some slapstick with the villains, and Dave is clearly an absolute moron, but at least the rest of the adults in the show behave like competent adults. And with that, I feel comes more mature humor. 
Now, it's not sophisticated by any means. It's just more grounded in reality, a little more than you think for a show of this concept. It's also woke as f <laughs> and that just adds to the humor. Two of my favorite characters are Alex's friends, Robin and Nicole. I completely forgot they existed, but I love that they gave Alex more than just one series regular friend. It really gave the writers a chance to give each character a unique voice and personality. As a result, you have Nicole, who is all about anti-capitalism and then human rights. The chemicals that you produce here are poisoning the earth and will one day make it completely uninhabitable. Thank you. And then Robin, who is a pessimistic environmentalist, um, isn't that your third? I guess we know who's not the designated driver tonight. This is funny and adds deeper layers to the show and its humor. Another comedic element I completely forgot about was Alex's daydreams. At first, I was a little taken out by them because they're a little campy and childish, but when I really thought about their purpose in the storytelling, I realized it was genius. Not only did it get every kid to relate with Alex, it taught a consistent lesson of integrity and responsibility. Showing Alex imagine how much easier the situation would be if she could just use her powers and then juxtaposing that with how she actually has to handle the problem made her a regular kid and relatable. Then because it's grounded in some sense of reality, the daydreams also allowed the show to take their humor further, with being goofy and more silly, catering to the viewers maybe too young to catch the wokeness. There's also a lot of humor incorporated into line delivery. And I know, filmmaking fundamentals, right? But for me, this shows they didn't just go with the first take to get it done and move on. They built the scene with purpose. And I never appreciated that as a kid. But listen, you can't have comedy without characters, can ya? Seamless segue! <laughs> Now, while the villains can seem a tad bit cookie cutter. Have a good night's sleep, kid. You won't have many more. You slip through my fingers for now, but tomorrow is another day. The secret world of Alex Mack has some of the most interesting relationship dynamics for Alex and the characters in her world. Of course, she and Ray are great and their friendship is magical and I buy their relationship, but just the contrast within the Mack family alone is terrific. You have George, who is the tech nerd scientist father, Barbara, the down to earth but more traditionally feminine mother, Annie's the overachieving intellectual older sister, and then you have Alex, who is the sporty, awkwardly average tomboy trying to fit in. Now, these characteristics alone set up complex relationships relationships and stories to explore, but it's the execution that really brings it to life. While each member of the Mac family and of course Ray get at least one episode to explore their relationship with Alex, it's the relationship with Annie that's ongoing and I find the most intriguing. Right off the bat, it's made very clear that Alex lives in Annie's certified genius level shadow. Don't expect me to be the award winning genius like Annie. We don't expect that, sweetie. That's true, Alex. In fact, if you just pass on to the next grade, they'll be ecstatic. And aside from that, Annie's obnoxiously using big words, condescending tones, and lecturing Alex on how she could be smarter. She could have easily have been vilified. Instead, the show made her part of Alex's inner circle and one of the only people she can trust with her powers. Now, when things go awry, this forces them to constantly work through their differences to support one another. The plant won't stop until they find me. Between my brains and your powers, that won't be too easy. Even times when Annie is in a bind, Alex is still there to support her out of sisterly love. Each situation comes down to supporting the ones you care about, and I think that's beautiful. What's cool is the show even explores the relationships between other characters as well. For example, Annie and George have several B stories, George and Barbara get a couple, and Annie and Barbara even have one or two. It really establishes deeper, more genuine connections, and it helps that everyone also just seems to have such great chemistry. See what I did there? Because chemistry is science. Well, let's talk about storytelling. But, but what if I can't reform again, and, and I'm destined to live the rest of my life as a puddle? Would that be such a loss? Every episode, of course, has an overarching lesson or message, but I don't think they necessarily beat you over the head with it because it doesn't feel like it's told in a kid way. Sure, I feel kids will still grasp whatever the message is, it's usually verbally stated, but it never felt dumbed down. It felt natural, and that's why I credit it to good storytelling. 
For example, my favorite episode of season one is episode eight titled Alex and Mom, obviously being an Alex Barbara centric episode. In this episode, Alex basically gets mad at Barbara for doing mom things and then calling her disorganized. Being a spoiled brat, Alex then uses her powers to disorganize Barbara's big presentation for Danielle, which of course results in their presentation going badly, but also nearly gets Barbara fired, so Alex feels guilty. Given one last shot, Barbara must oversee a charity event the following day where the caterers don't show up, but Alex and all her friends do to support Support. Alex then goes above and beyond to make amends doing some weird water show that's definitely suspicious but I digress. Now it could have stopped there but after that Alex then also comes clean and admits that she disorganized the paperwork that set this entire chain reaction in motion. Yesterday I was so angry at you calling me disorganized that I disorganized your files. You ain't have to come clean. Girl, you was in the clear. But she did, and I thought that was a touching moment of integrity and honesty. And that's another thing. The show does a really great job teaching kids that it's okay to make mistakes as long as you take responsibility for your actions. Alexandra Mack makes some of the stupidest decisions and mistakes constantly. But I was not once annoyed because she's a kid and they showed that she always learned from and owned up to them. Except when she's trying to steal Jessica Alba's boyfriend, Scott. I had a slight problem with her justification being, well, she's mean. That doesn't make it okay, Alex. Anyway, another example of taking responsibility is from episode two, Shock Value. Alex uses her powers to show off in science class, and this is what I mean when I say stupid decisions, but unable to explain how she made it happen, she begs for Annie's help, who does? But only by giving Alex a textbook and the tools she needs to make the project actually do whatever she made it do with her powers. I adore that tough love. In the end, she manages to get it done and even presents the science behind it to her class so it's clear she learned something through the process. I just feel like that's such effective storytelling for a 90s kid show and it needs to be praised. Now, of course with praise comes criticisms. It is indeed a product of its time. Occasionally it does get over the top and goofy with forced conflicts and cheesy lines of dialogue. And while the season finale led to a beautiful bonding moment between Alex and George, paralleled by another between Annie and Barbara, nothing was really special about the episode and it was rather anticlimactic. I do recognize it was a different time, season finales weren't as epic, it's not like this was Pretty Little Liars, and as a sitcom the episodes need to be self-contained so a viewer can pop in at any time and know what's going on, but it was still a bit of a letdown. That said, it still always felt like the show was progressing somewhere, and that's something to commend because these early Nick shows had some absolutely atrocious bottle episodes. And don't get me wrong, episode 12 of The Seagull Road of Alex Mack is a mess and so blatantly bad, it took me two sittings to finish a 24 minute episode. However, all things considered, the show is definitely much better than I remember. And this was an exciting reintroduction to the series. I somewhat remember it getting better with time. So I'm just as excited to bring y'all part two of this Alex Mack retrospective. And if I'm correct, season two should be bringing us even more harebrained schemes to find the GC 161 kid, more junior high drama for Alex and Ray, and even an Alex Mack book series I had no idea existed. So we got a lot more twists, turns, and surprises to come, folks. I almost got caught in the lint trap. Do you know what that's like? All right, thank you so much for watching. If you made it this far in the video, I really appreciate your support. Comment your favorite color below and it could be like our secret, I made it to the end of Todd's video thing. I'm also able to keep making videos like these with donations from viewers like you. So if you'd like to contribute even just a dollar, I'd be tremendously appreciative and feature you here as one of our premium supporters. As I said, I was super surprised by the first season. I was just like, I can't watch the rest of the show. I already have so much to say. But like I mentioned, I think taking it one season at a time is the best way to do it. I don't want to feel rushed through the show. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed part one of the Alex Mack retrospective. Let me know what you thought of the video and the show in the comments with your favorite color. Similar to what I stated in my Animorphs video, there are a couple episodes I'd love to do a deep dive or detailed recap for, so if that does interest you, comment that below with the title of the episode as well. And as far as more videos, I've got another Animorphs video still coming. Someone mentioned the famous Jet Jackson in the comments in my last video, so that's now been added to the list. I also still have that Cousin Skeeter video and then continuing the Alex Mack series, so we got a lot of good stuff coming. In the meantime, go ahead and stick around, click some buttons, you know, just check out the rest of my videos here. Yeah. Uh,
Follow me on social. Don't forget to hit that thumbs up. It really helps me out. Then subscribe with a sound notification bell. Until next time, shine on your crazy diamonds.